Uh, thank you. Welcome to uh, everybody for showing up for our first uh, Monroe Center for Social Inquiry talk this year on the topic of conspiracy theories, conspiracy facts. Uh, I think the subtitle is uh, Explaining a Perplexing Social Phenomenon, something like that. Uh, I'm Brian Keeley. I'm a professor of philosophy here. I also teach in the neuroscience program and uh, the science, technology, and society program. And I'm very honored to have been picked this year to uh, run the series and wanted to take the advantage of this very first talk in the series to tell you a little bit about what we're doing for the rest of the semester so that hopefully if you like this one, uh, you can come back and maybe see one or two more. Everybody's welcome to come. Uh, so this is just the funny, the funny slide to start things off and the, the moral here is sometimes Trevor is right. So, so yes, and this is part of the, uh, the Monroe Center for Social Inquiry, which is a seminar, and there's a number of students here from the seminar, uh, as well as uh, public talks around a particular topic. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing today, but next week we're kicking it off with quickly with two talks, one week after the other. And next week we're going to be hearing from, uh, oops. Sorry, I've got to get my, get my act together. We're going to be hearing from uh, Catherine Olmsted, who is an American historian. Uh, she's, been, she's written a number of books, uh, including uh, Real Enemies, Conspiracy Theories uh, from World War I to 9-11, as well as her most recent book is Right Out of California, which talks about the rise of uh, right-wing politics in the United States uh, and uh, the, the, you know, basically where Reagan and Nixon came from, but what had happened several decades earlier uh, that led to uh, right-wing politics or a particular growth of a particular kind of right-wing politics and she's going to be talking about uh, her title is just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you anti-government conspiracy theories in American history uh, so we're going to start off a little bit of history next week uh, and one of the things I want to stress is when you hear that it's, it's a conference on or a series of talks on conspiracy theories we're not going to be spending time necessarily going through you know, Alex Jones' latest conspiracy theory on one thing or David Icke's uh, conspiracy theory about lizard people and so forth. These things are going to be talked about, but what we're really doing this semester is what uh, our final speaker, Matthew Dentith, calls conspiracy theory theory. That is the study of conspiracy theories. Why do people hold the views that they have? What is the nature of the views? What sorts of things are legitimately called conspiracy theories? Which things maybe, uh, uh, maybe ought not be called that? Right? We're going to be hearing from a number of people who are going to talk about the phenomenon of conspiracy theorizing and conspiracy theorists and conspiracy theories and trying to kind of put it into uh, an academic lens. So as I said, next week we're going to have uh, a historian talk about the history of, of American conspiracy theories. Then about two weeks after that, we're going to have a philosopher come, Lee Basham. And of the people who may or actually believe some of the crazier conspiracy theories, Lee may be that. Uh, I've known Lee for a couple of years, and I can't tell whether he really believes these things or whether he's just a good philosopher who takes things seriously and like, let's, uh, let's take it seriously and make like it's true and then see what happens. Uh, but in particular, he wants to talk about the phenomenon of toxic truth. Uh, the idea that there might be some things which maybe ought to be believed, but there's a price to believing them, right? If, the, if you believe certain things to be true, it means other things that you hold dear might be challenged in a particular way. Truths that are toxic in one way or another to uh, the rest of your life and things about worrying about maybe the our U.S. government doing particular things, which if they're true means something particularly bad about our, uh, our democracy and, and how it operates. And so he wants to explore the topic of toxic truths. And then about two weeks after that, we're going to have uh, Joe Yusinski, who's a political scientist. Uh, the, uh, his title of his paper uh, is actually his thesis, Conspiracy Theories Are for Losers, uh, because one of his theses, he's a political scientist who's looked at the history of conspiracy theories. One myth he's going to try to debunk is the idea that we believe more in conspiracy theories now than we did in the past. He actually has some interesting data to show that actually, no, conspiracy theories have been there in, American, in the American context, particularly going back to the Declaration of Independence, but that there hasn't necessarily been a growth in overall growth in conspiracy theories. However, there has been changes. Who 
who believes in conspiracy theories at any given period in American history is a function of whether or not you're in power or not, or your people you see as your political ideologues are in power. And so he has, his, his slogan says, conspiracy theories are for losers because he argues that, that the, the lo if you're not in power, then you're much more likely to believe in conspiracy theories than if the party that you believe in is in power. Uh, even though the total number of conspiracy theory uh, believers in any given time holds relatively constant. Uh, so if you're interested in the political science of conspiracy theories, come and hear what Joe has to say. And then we're going to have uh, go a little bit international. So we have Lilith Mahmoud coming from UC Irvine. She's an anthropologist as well as uh, works in the areas of gender and feminist studies. And she particularly looks at the phenomenon of Freemasonry in Italy. Uh, and Freemasonry in Italy is expresses in a very different way in a lot of ways than Freemasonry in the United States. And you can come and hear about that. And in particular, she's interested in women Freemasons. So first there are these secret societies, the Freemasons in Italy, and then the double secret is that there are actually women in these societies. They're not male dominated the way that many people thinking about Freemasons tend to think. There are women uh, only Freemason societies. And uh, she as an anthropologist worked with uh, some, a number of these groups. Uh, she herself is of Eatrean descent who grew up in Italy. So she has a kind of interesting relationship to uh, Italy uh, due to her upbringing. Uh, but she will be coming and talking to us about the kind of interplay between sexuality and Freemasonry, and particularly uh, the idea of how conspiracy theories play out in a non-American context. And then on uh, November 7th, we've got John Jackson coming, who is a, a dean uh, at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he is trained as an anthropologist. And actually, he's the one who I'm least sure what he's going to talk about, because I've yet to get an abstract out of him. But he is an expert in uh, a variety of religious movements, particularly religious movements in the, the American urban context. So he works on things like Nation of Islam and other uh, uh, religious movements that are particularly express themselves in urban environments in America, and uh, his title is What's Love Got to Do With It? Race, Social Justice, and an Anthropology of Feeling. Uh, so that's also going to be our Atherton lecture, uh, which is a special lecture that we have every year named after the John Atherton. Uh, and uh, so we're really looking forward to that one. That's on November 7th. And then we got on the 14th, two weeks after that, Jack Bradditch, who a number of years ago wrote a book that I'm showing here, Conspiracy Panics. Uh, he is a uh, media critic and a journalist uh, working in, at the University of Rutgers, or Rutgers University. And in particular, he's interested in the role that the media plays in, uh, you know, in some sense, ginning up worries about various kinds of panics, and in particular, panics around conspiracies where uh, the, the media, and maybe we can ask our journalists today whether they're participating in uh, creating a panic around uh, the worries about conspiracy theories in our culture. And he's very interested in the ways in which we can, the same way that you know panics get driven about communist in our culture or about now you know it's the alt-right, right? There's all sorts of things where the media is focusing on a particular issue, and the question is whether they're blowing it out of proportion or whether they are making it look like a worse problem than it actually is. He's interested in the kind of the interplay between media and, and the ways in which media gets sold uh, as, as, a, uh, as a cultural phenomenon. Okay. And then the final speaker, uh, I've just mentioned him. Uh, he came up with the term conspiracy theory theory. Uh, this is Matt Dentith, another philosopher. I'm a philosopher, so you're going to get a couple of philosophers. Uh, and Matt uh, wrote this great book called The Philosophy of Conspiracy Theories, which is the only single monograph dedicated to looking at the philosophical aspects of conspiracy theories. And uh, he has a number of kind of interesting ways of analyzing what's going on in conspiracies. And as he says in his title, uh, his title is going to be Investigating Conspiracy Theories, the case for treating conspiracy theories seriously, even the apparently ridiculous ones. Uh, and he is currently a postdoctoral fellow in um, Bucharest, uh, and I think he's uh, got another position he's going to be moving on to soon, but we will hear about that from him. He also has a podcast, uh, The Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, uh, which is uh, something that's fun to listen to if you want to hear about different kinds of conspiracy theories that they talk about. So that's what we're going to be doing over the course of the semester. Um, so what we want to do, and as I said, what we're mainly doing is this conspiracy theory theory. But actually today might be a little bit of an exception to that, because today we've got two journalists um, who are going to talk to us. We're going to take about 30 minutes with each 
25 to 30 minutes each. Tell us a little bit about what is it like to be a, a journalist who is working in the current uh, milieu around conspiracy theories. So maybe we will hear about a couple of conspiracy theories that are active ones that are ongoing. Uh, so what we're going to do is, like I said, hear from about each of them for about 30 minutes each. And then we will hopefully convene up here. Then the three of us will be a panel and hopefully take questions from the audience and uh, see what you guys have to ask about conspiracy theories and being a journalist these days. So we're going to listen to uh, Nick first, and then uh, Ben will be the second. So, um, so Nick Scow is uh, an editor at the OC Weekly, so he's one of our local folks just down the road. And uh, when he's not being an editor, he's actually written a number of books. Uh, probably the one that he's probably most well known for is called Kill the Messenger, uh, which is uh, how the CIA's crack cocaine controversy destroyed the journalist Gary Webb. Uh, some of you may have seen a movie with Jeremy Renter, Renner that was based on the movie. But he's also written a number of things on uh, both the CIA and, uh, and investigative journalism around the CIA, as well as investigative journalism around the war on drugs. And in fact, he was recently featured in a history uh, channel, uh, was a four-part series uh, on the war, the contemporary war on drugs, and he was one of the people that was featured in that. Uh, I have yet to get a chance to see it because I don't get cable, so I haven't been able to watch it. Uh, but he's also written um, a book called Orange Sunshine, The Brotherhood of Eternal Love and Its Quest to Spread Peace, Love, and Acid to the World, uh, having to do with our, our drug culture. That seemed like the perfect thing to bring to Pitzer. I don't know why. but uh, So let me turn it over to Nick and and then we'll hear from our next speaker afterwards. Thank you for coming. Can everyone hear me okay from, from where I am right now? Yeah. All right, perfect, perfect. Yeah, hold on. Are we good? There, now I can hear. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, about secrecy, and um, and the role that it plays in conspiracy theories, and also just in in, in investigative reporting, because um, you know there's always going to be a world that exists out there that nobody's ever going to be aware of uh, until it gets reported. And so things are kind of conspiracies or things are unreported rumor until actual reporters go out and do their jobs and find out whether it's real or not and then it becomes history. And so journalism, uh, and it, it, in particular investigative reporting, is kind of on the edge of that spear. I mean you're always kind of trying to puncture the secret world and try to advance knowledge and shed light on things and it's extremely difficult to do. Um, and the, a real lesson that I got in that uh, came early in my career. Uh, I started out in journalism in 1996, and it was the same year that a San Jose Mercury News reporter named Gary Webb wrote this uh, three-part series about the role of the CIA in the uh, protection of drug smugglers that were involved in the explosion of crack cocaine in the inner cities. And so the Mercury News was uh, in Silicon Valley. This was the mid-1990s. And this uh, three-part series that was published was the first story that was simultaneously published online on this brand new website that the Mercury News had. And I think that if it hadn't been online with this very compelling visual presentation, it might have been ignored because it was published in mid-August, which is kind of like the news hole when nobody's really paying attention to anything, especially in Washington, it shuts down for the entire month. And so there wasn't any real reaction to this story at first. And uh, at the time that I was working at OC Weekly, I was covering police and uh, issues relating to the drug war and uh, police brutality. And when I read this story in the Mercury News, I was just blown away. I mean, it, first of all, it was really just a, a sweeping story with a lot of incredibly important um, arguments to be made about the, the nature of the war on drugs and uh, the nature of the relationship between the U.S. national intelligence community, the war on communism in Latin America, the explosion of drug usage in the 1980s in the inner city and so it was, there was a lot there but for me as a local reporter covering police the thing that I really picked up on was the drug ring that Gary Webb wrote about it was a real organization uh, Freeway Ricky Ross 
who the LA Times had, uh, identified as probably the kingpin of crack cocaine, if anybody was, uh, in, a, in a 1994 profile. He was arrested in October 1986, and a lot of his associates in South Central and, and various parts of LA were also arrested. But that same day, there was an ex Laguna police uh, detective in Mission Viejo in a mansion that was arrested in connection with this drug ring, which struck me as very odd. And on top of that, when the police arrived at this de ex-detective's house, he said, you know, you're making a huge mistake. I knew you guys were coming, but I didn't think you'd be dumb enough to actually do this. Don't you know who I work for? And he claimed that he worked for the CIA. So the cops were like, okay. You know, they found, they found that kind of amusing, but they started digging through the evidence in this guy's house, and they found pictures of uh, the detective uh, in Central America with the Contras. They found numerous notes from all these missile deals that he was involved with and telephone numbers of people in Washington, D.C. So there was like a whole treasure trove of like evidence that there was something to this guy that was out there. But as a reporter, you know, it was difficult to kind of get a hold of that stuff. It took a while. The Sheriff's Department tried to deny that they had ever participated in any raid. They didn't have any, any material or any evidence. But I had a source who worked in Army Intelligence that somehow had a copy of some of this stuff. And so working off of that, I started developing these various lines of inquiry. And I knew I was competing with the LA Times and, and later the New York Times and Washington Post and trying to get to the bottom of this. And because the CIA immediately leaked to all the major newspapers their side of the story, which was that this was complete nonsense and they had nothing to do with any of these individuals. And so it really became the job of actual investigative reporters to try to find out, well, is that true or not? And in the particular case of this cop, Ronald Lister, and the, the raid that happened, you know, I knew there was more to it because what happened was is I went to the... Uh, to the uh, California Secretary of State's office and looked up the paperwork on his consulting firm, which was at the same time he was involved with this drug ring, was going down and pitching security services to the uh, the government of El Salvador, specifically a, a general who was a defense minister and a uh, the leader of the National Assembly, Roberto Dabasan, who was most famous as the, the director of the uh, extrajudicial death squads in the country. So a very interesting guy with an interesting company. So on the paperwork for his company was a person that I, I found out actually used to work for the CIA. So very quickly, within about a week of jumping on the story, I'm on the phone with a guy. And I asked him point blank, did you ever work for the CIA? And he said, yes. And then when he realized what I was asking him about and his relationship with this cop and the story that, that this cop was involved involving drugs, the guy just started freaking out and panicked and just completely hung up the phone on me. And it was like one of those moments out of a movie where I was like, OK, maybe there is something to this story. So I ended up talking to another uh, employer that had worked with this cop who actually was still in suburban Virginia, like a stone's throw away from the CIA, and had actually published uh, books on uh, electronic surveillance. And so he was a real technical expert. And, um, and after he figured out what I was up to, I, he had the same reaction, just total uh, you know, panic. And then he said something very interesting, which was that, uh, he posed to me a question, hasn't it ever occurred to you that there might be people that don't want the story to come out? And he just put it out there. And I thought about it, and I was like, yeah, that, that has occurred to me. But I mean, him saying that kind of, it does something to certain reporters. It tells you that you're on the right track, and you just become even more determined to try to figure out what's really going on. So sadly, um, and this was really instructive to me, and ultimately made me even more determined on my end, that's not what the rest of the news media did. Uh, so, first, after ignoring the story for a while, but then seeing how um, the African American community and the Congressional Black Caucus was not going to let this go away, they were demanding hearings, they wanted answers. Finally, the first the Washington Post, then the New York Times, and the LA Times finally ran stories basically claiming to get to the bottom of what really happened, but they didn't actually dig into the, the story as well as they could have if they'd really been objective about what they were doing. So, one moment. And so, what happened was, unfortunately, the sheer volume of denials that was coming out of the CIA and the willingness of these other powerful news institutions to pretty much, you know, uncritically publish those denials effectively buried Webb's uh, career. And so, his own newspaper ultimately took him off the story. 
they assigned another reporter to try to go in and you know write like kind of an inside story of how it, how the story went wrong and then they published like a, a half apology saying well you know some of it was right but most of it was wrong and you know we we failed our readers gary you know he didn't back down from a fight that guy and he published, you know, and spoke to me and other reporters, you know, a, a, a rebuttal against the rebuttal that effectively sealed his fate as a reporter. I mean, after that, his journalism career was pretty much finished. So meanwhile, you know, I'd filed all these Freedom of Information Act requests on all the different loose ends that I had noticed, and I started getting results. I found out, well, gee, this cop that had no relationship with the CIA um, he, one of his business partners for a several year period in Orange County was the former de deputy director of operations of the CIA itself, who was working uh, at a different company at the time. But they had this business relationship and I didn't know what it was about because the CIA wouldn't tell me. They blocked out page after page after page of information on this relationship. But it was clear that the FBI had, had interviewed this ex-CIA official and that the CIA official admitted to the FBI that he had tried to help Lister with his problems at the CIA but he couldn't do it and they had to end their relationship. So. You know, I would write these stories kind of advancing the big picture about like whether Gary was right or wrong over the years as this information started to like slowly dribble out. Um, and I was having really, you know, just a, a, an amazing series of experiences, some of which I already described over the phone, but also going to San Diego to a house of a former Navy SEAL that was part of this story, who at one point like spotted me and charged out of his house and almost tackled me, you know, completely like uh, panicked about the fact that a reporter was knocking on his door. But, um, you know, constantly running up against all these sort of brick walls in my reporting and I would share them with Gary but I could tell that like his time wore on and he was trying to kind of move on with his life you know that there was uh, you know kind of like a shrinking world for him um, and that world for him ended sadly on uh, <clears throat> in December uh, 2004 when he took his own life which um, you know, it was really a, a, a difficult experience to go through. Um, and I got to know his family over the years. And I felt like determined to uh, write a book that would sort of set the record straight on what Gary got right, what he got wrong, what the media sort of got right and what it got wrong. And so I investigated his whole life and I investigated the whole kind of scandal that destroyed his career. And. Uh, you know, ultimately that became a movie, uh, which was a story in and of itself. But um, after the movie came out, I finally uh, got a phone call from Ronald Lister himself, the guy that was sort of the person that I was chasing after all these years and I'd never been able to interview. And he expressed, uh, you know, his <laughs> interest in the fact that this movie had gotten made and congratulated me. And he said that he wanted to meet with me to talk about Gary Webb. And so, I sat down for drinks with this guy, and it was just like the the people in the FBI and the uh, the sheriff's department and some of these other agencies that investigated him had described him as the type of person where, literally, when you'd sit across the table from him, like the uh, hair on the back of your neck starts to stick up. I mean, he was a genuinely creepy guy. He, you know, he knew that I knew a whole lot more about him than he wanted anyone to know, and I knew, you know, he had testified uh, to the John. Uh, Carry uh, inquiry into uh, CIA and Contra drug activity back in the uh, early or late late 80s, early 90s, and I knew he was uh, that was all classified, and he was never going to probably tell me anything new that I didn't already know. And so, <laughs> you know, it was a really weird interview because for the first time I was able to get him on the record, but I, I kind of wasn't sure how much I was going to be able to get. And I asked him, just tell me what you can tell me, and he just sat down and he took out a piece of paper and started sketching these two circles and he said Nick you know there's this circle over here is like what we can talk about and then there's this circle over here that we can't talk about see this is like the secret world over here and it's not supposed to mix with this other circle they just come close sometimes and sometimes bleed in a little bit and sometimes secrets get out but they're really not supposed to meet up together and they're certainly not supposed to cross over so he kind of had me scratching my head at that I was like all right what am I going to do with that and I just flat out asked him it was Gary Webb right or wrong and and he thought about it for a few minutes and he said he was right the problem was is that he didn't realize that he was going down a road that he wasn't supposed to go down. He wasn't supposed to go as far as he did with this type of story. It was never supposed to get published. And unfortunately, you know, when you 
when you go down that road, you do so at your own peril. And that's what happened to Gary Webb. So to me, again, like hearing that in the face of all the things that I knew, I mean, it, it actually made sense. Like as a reporter, there's so much more that I felt I knew and was gonna be able to prove than I ultimately was. But at the same time, it's the purpose of being an investigative reporter to try to puncture that and to try to do everything you can to try to understand this secret world and to try to shed light on it. So my most recent book was really interesting because uh, I actually had the opportunity to go back to Washington, D.C., and I did interviews with all the kind of leading investigative reporters, many of whom are breaking all the big stories right now at the New York Times, the Washington Post, places like that, and, uh, and talked to them about how they do their work. And they, they freely admitted to me, some of the most illustrious national security reporters, that they really have no idea what's going on. Um, the world that they cover is so obscure and so dark and secret and hard to penetrate that the very best reporters working on the most important stories of our day feel like they only know maybe 20% of the facts on any particular story that they're writing. Some of it even less than that. And so that's why you see all these stories with like, you know, five or six different reporters on the byline is that they're all scrambling to find little pieces, little nuggets of the truth and try to combine it into something people can, you know, wrap their heads around. So I also, when I was on that trip, I met with the CIA itself. Uh, I went into the public affairs unit and, uh, and I talked to them and got their side of the story. And what was interesting about that discussion is that the CIA, you know, has a rumored reputation of sort of like, you know, as was the case actually for quite a long time up until the Watergate era, they actually directly controlled the press. They had uh, various editors and, and radio outlets and, and publications all on their payroll. And then that was abolished after, uh, after Watergate and the Pentagon Papers scandal. And after that, they had to pretty much, um, you know, revise their strategy and make it a little bit more sophisticated. So what I examined with my last book was just the evolution of this relationship between the CIA and the press and how it's sort of become much more pernicious than a lot of people understand. So a lot of people, when I talk to them about this, they still have the idea, well, the CIA controls the press or the deep state controls the press. But that's not really true uh, as far as it goes. I mean, what, what you have is a, a cadre of very you know, smart, dedicated, in many cases, hard-hitting investigative reporters, but they're so reliant on their sources in the national security world that they just can't function without them. They're basically dependent on their sources. And, and the CIA knows how to play that and, and just uh, reward reporters that send their stories to them, you know, like in complete detail. Like one of the most prominent national security reporters today, you know, has already done that several times and got caught doing it and should have been fired. But honestly, that's how they do their work. They give the CIA a heads up on what they're working about. They, uh, you know, they don't try to double cross the, the agency. And in, in return, the agency will give them like, you know, a little guidance here and there. But um, ultimately, uh, the job of the CIA when it comes to the press is to just literally stop the presses. They basically just want to like keep stories out of the press as often as they can. They claim, with some justification here and there, that they're trying to just protect their own, you know, employees and like you know they're just, they're operating in a very dangerous world. But it, go, it, it when you really look at it and really study it, it's clear that they're just trying to prevent damaging information from getting out, and they're able to do it. And that's the scariest thing. And I can think of no better example of that than James Risen of the New York Times, who was ironically one of the <laughs> reporters that attacked Gary Webb back in the day, but I was able to interview him for the last book I did, and he broke two of the most important stories of like the last 10 years, one of which was about the NSA wiretapping and, uh, and how this was illegal. And it, it basically, the New York Times had sat on that story for probably two years, I think it was, through two administrations. They just like refused to publish it. Only when he had a book deal and they knew that he was going to expose this, this scandal in his book did they finally agree to publish it. And this happened a, a couple of times on other stories that he wrote, and I, in my last book I go into a lot of detail about all that, but I asked him, you know, what is, the, what is you know, the takeaway from all this? Like, why is it that, you know, that the CIA is kind of able to get away with this, and what, what's the danger that it sort of poses to our society? And he was very stark in his, you know, answer and in his analysis. And he said that, um, 
you know, ever since 9-11, the level of secrecy has expanded in this country to such unprecedented levels that people are just completely unaware of how out of control it is. And that simultaneously, and I can attest to this because I grew up in D.C., and every time I come back to, to, to the area and I land at Dulles Airport, I see, like, the huge amount of construction along that corridor. When I was a kid, my sister and I used to just play a game to see who could spot the airport tower uh, first because in between D.C., and Dulles Airport was nothing but farmland. Now it's like the biggest megapolis. It's like downtown Atlanta. All the private companies and security contractors are based there. And all this kind of like, you know, it existed before 9-11, but it just really picked up steam afterwards to the point where we have this huge kind of secret government basically running things nowadays. And this is James Risen talking, not me. And to him he said, you know, it's a compound sort of tragedy because on the one hand, I mean, we're, Americans are subjected to this constant drumbeat of stories that make them afraid. You know, we, I think that's a, a big part of why people believe in so many conspiracy theories and distrust the government and distrust, distrust the media. It's just that they're in a constant state of fear. But the, the real danger, according to him, is that they're afraid of the wrong things. We have a national security state that's completely out of control, uh, global instability unlike anything we've seen, the White House, a complete mess. People have a right to be afraid, but they need to be educated about what the real threats are and what the real things that they should be afraid are. And uh, that's where we fit in. So I'll turn it over to uh, Ben to talk about some of his experiences. minutes to do the switch the AV over. So, just a second. Hey everybody, I'm Ben. Hey, Good to see you. I work at the Daily Beast. I'm a senior news editor there. Um, uh, so I, I cover a lot of like Alex Jones. Can I get a show of hands how many people know who Alex Jones is here? All right, cool. So some of you are in for a wild ride. Um, <laughs> He's not a very good person. In a couple seconds, he, I'm going to show you a tweet that he sent to me. Um, it's not a very good tweet. He doesn't like me very much because I cover him a lot. Um, Alex Jones runs a website called InfoWars. Here's the tweet. Um, so it'll come up larger in a second. But he basically prescribed me what I think colloquially would be known as boner pills that he sells through his website. He, has a, uh, he runs a website called InfoWars, which traffics exclusively in conspiracy theories. And um, they are, uh, they're, yeah, it's crazy. Um, uh, and it, part of my, like, he, he had attacked one of our writer's stories, and he prescribed us both various different things in his store. So uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Sorry about that, guys. Um, and I'll tell you how I got into this. So uh, not in a traditional way. I used to cover uh, less exciting stuff than this, certainly. Um, and then, uh, one second. Um, yeah, yeah, next slide, okay, thank you. Um, and then, so my friend is on the right here. I went to college with a guy on the right, and we had a really bad uh, sports radio show on our college radio thing, where we, I don't know, it was very bad. Uh, his name's Chris Hurst, and he's a news reporter in Virginia. And his uh, girlfriend was also a news reporter in Virginia. And I have to remember this a couple years ago. Um, she was doing a story at like an amusement park. It was like a like a fluffy sort of morning news story. She was doing it on the air, and uh, she and her cameraman were both shot and killed live on television. It was a tough thing. Um, so uh, that happened, and uh, Chris had a few rough days for a while. And they were exacerbated by the fact that um, a bunch of people on the internet, if you Googled his name, and maybe right now too, um, will tell you that he doesn't exist, that he is a CIA plot, that he is a crisis actor. And crisis actors are what uh, conspiracy theorists believe are uh, made up people by the government who uh, will take away your guns, will, or, or their purpose is to create events that will allow the United States government to take away your guns eventually. And this was one of those things. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is a quote by the guy who's not actually to the right or left of me or behind me, the guy up there. It's Brian Keeley. Um, I talked to him for this story, and that's how I met him. And uh, he, uh, this, is a, this was a quote that gave me a lot of solace. It's in a paper that he wrote in 1999, so a long time ago. And uh, you can look at it, but it, you know, the, the idea that um, you know, there, 
people who believe in this are the last believers in an ordered universe. Not Alex Jones. Alex Jones is in this to sell boner pills. Let's get that out of the way. But the people who believe in Alex Jones are not necessarily doing this for nefarious reasons. They're not doing it for revenge. They're not doing it to be angry at my friend for no reason. <laughs> uh, they're doing it because they want to believe that you know a random guy wouldn't just go to an amusement park and just shoot former coworkers in the face. They are a government plot, because then obviously we can fix it, right? If we get rid of the government plot, then everything's fixed. We don't have like random terrible events. We have uh, a few guys in suits in a shady part of the government. Uh, well, here's the problem. CIA are shady guys who do weird stuff all the time. But um, they're not doing these little minute things. And it allows people to believe this. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. So part of the problem with this um, is that I then became <laughs> part of the CIA, which is weird because I'm not smart enough for that. I'm just not even close. Um, and I look shitty in suits, so it would be very bad for me. So these are people on YouTube, uh, almost always guys who look like that, like very serious looking dudes who like lift all the time and have bald heads <laughs> yelling at me. It's terrible, but there's a lot of it. So don't YouTube, don't look up YouTube, my name, don't do it. Um, there's another one, if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, this this is, has like the Illuminati eye in it and like uh, Robocop maybe, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so uh, let's go to the let's go to the next slide. So uh, none of this would have mattered uh, at all. None of it would have mattered. Um, I probably would have been covering this. I would have gone back to covering stupid stuff on the internet. But then uh, this guy happened. This guy went down an el uh, escalator at his own place, and all these people are paid. They're giving fifty bucks back in the day. They don't need the fifty bucks anymore. Um, yeah, so he happened. Uh, go to the next slide, please. That'd be good. Um, and then he pretty much immediately got into this shit. So uh, this is a tweet that he sent that when he didn't know how to retweet stuff. Um, uh, it's about how 81% of white people are killed by black people. Obviously, that's not true. It's not even fucking close. Uh, it's the opposite of that, but it doesn't matter. He cited the Crime Statistics Bureau of San Francisco, which is not a thing. So... Uh, <laughs> This happens all the time. This is like a quarter of my job. At, mm, it's not great. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and part of it is that uh, Alex Jones, who trafficked personally in, in um, my friend's uh, life getting ruined twice, uh, is read by Donald Trump um, all the time. Uh, it is not good. This is what Donald Trump said um, must be like, but it's less than 20 months ago, December of 2015, after he was running, he went on InfoWars, and he said, your reputation is amazing, I will not let you down, you'll be very, very impressed, and I think we'll be speaking a lot. So, uh, this is where he's getting his information. It's not great. Um, I'll go to the next slide, please. So, I, uh, this is proof. Um, so, this is Politico on the left. He, what would happen is his advisors would plant good quotes in friendly out, out, uh, news outlets that um, are open to White House gossip of any kind, particularly ones that are friendly to the president. So Jason Miller and things like that would go and plant it on his desk. And then, um, yeah, so they print it out and they print it on his desk. So it's important to know that this is from last week in the New York Times. Uh, Donald Trump did not have a web browser on his phone. He doesn't have a laptop. So he just watched Fox News all day, and then people, like, not a joke, Omarosa from The Apprentice would print it out and walk into the Oval Office and just drop this on his desk. Um, that's how he would get information. And it was always these conspiracy things or, like, or just friendly media. So if you think this guy has an enormous ego, it's in part because he doesn't think he's doing anything wrong. And then he turns on CNN, and he's like, oh my god, who are these monsters? And it's because there, there's just a whole... It's a bifurcated reality. He lives in a different one than we do. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is a, a stock photo of a dad that I found. It's really good. Um, so if you're wondering, ah, my dad, my dad, personally, my dad doesn't uh, read InfoWars. Uh, why is he saying all this shit from InfoWars, right? He doesn't read Breitbart. Why is he read, what, saying all the shit from Breitbart? There's a very good reason for it. You don't have to read InfoWars to get InfoWars information. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, and it, it, so I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Human Centipede. Um, it is apparently 100% medically accurate. I learned that when I put this slide up. If you haven't seen it, don't see it. Next slide, please. 
Um, so this is called the human centipede of intentionally bad information. We, this is, we legitimately call it that in this office. Um, so let me walk through this. And this is how it gets to your dad. Um, 4chan and anonymous Twitter accounts. So. 4chan is a website for 13-year-olds to post wild conspiracy theories and uh, anime pornography. Um, they do that a lot. Um, so people will post random, you, there, you're not allowed to have a name on the site. You just post something and it comes up anonymously. And people will post random stuff about and elaborate conspiracies about things that they think are going to happen. Screenshots of that will show up on Reddit, on this uh, subreddit called The Donald which is the largest Donald Trump community on the internet. And they'll be like, look at this guy from 4chan. He has all this dirt. He says he's from the deep state. Yeah. That's apparently enough for InfoWars sometimes, who picks up the Reddit post. And they will say like, I, I, look, I'm not saying anything. I'm just I'm not saying, I'm just saying. But here's a post from Reddit that says this thing. And then after that, there's this website called Gateway Pundit and a bunch of other right-wing blogs sort of like that that has no... Uh, editorial standards whatsoever. <laughs> and uh, it's a guy named Jim Hoft, and he has this other guy named Lucien Wintrich, and they have a White House press pass. And they will take things from InfoWars and put it up uh, on their website as fact. And then that goes to the Drudge Report, and that's the biggest fucking problem there is because they get a billion page views a month. Once it's on the Drudge Report, Rush Limbaugh will talk about it, and then, holy grail, it goes to Fox News. And then once it's on Fox News, it does this fun thing called reinforcing the anonymous bullshit from up top. They say, oh my god, it must be real. Fox News, who I view as legitimate, has picked up my random conspiracy theory that is made up on 4chan. So then it goes over and over again. And then eventually, it'll show up on your dad's Facebook page. It will happen. I've seen it, and I've heard it at Thanksgiving. Next slide, please. All right, so here's an example of that. Um, this is a guy who did it just to test it out. He was a troll that was doing it intentionally. His name's Marco Chacon. He, um, he, what he did was invented a, uh, a Hillary Clinton email, a leaked Hillary Clinton email that he took a screenshot of, printed it out, highlighted it, uh, scanned it back onto his computer as to make it look official, and then he put it on Twitter anonymously. And uh, the problem is the quote was from My Little Pony. Not a joke. By the end of the day, the tweet was read on Megyn Kelly's television show. So this takes 12 hours. It doesn't take a lot of time. It just gets there. She retracted it because he came out and said, uh, I'm just a guy. He's an accountant from Florida. Anybody can do this. And they did. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is uh, horrifying. So you remember when Donald Trump was saying that he knew, knew that 3 million people voted illegally in the election? Uh, well, it's from this guy named Greg Phillips who um, made up the number of whole cloth. He didn't have any stats for it or anything, but a few weeks before the election, he said on his tweet that 3 million people will vote illegally. And then InfoWars picked that up as like, here's a man who tweeted this thing. <laughs> and that's all it took. That is it. That's how we got that information. This guy made the rounds on CNN and Fox News. He, this is a dude who had been... Um, he was a, previously a public official, and he was wildly corrupt in Louisiana and Arizona, and he was pushed out of the state as a way to not go to prison. Um, that's how he got the information. So if you think that any of that shit's real, it's not. Next slide, please. Um, this is my favorite one. This was a week before the election. Um, I can't believe this is true. But there was this rumor going around that Hillary Clinton worshiped Satan. And that was because she went to a, a Marina Abramovich uh, performance art thing. Anyways, these people just are artless hacks. They just don't understand that, like, oh, art's supposed to be interesting. They want it to, everything to be like, like Rembrandt's. But some of it's modern, modern art, regardless. Um, so uh, Hannity found this out and tweeted. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of rumors going around Reddit and 4chan and Twitter. Hannity found it out, put it a story up on his own website the week before the election saying that, you know, uh, she's a, a part of a bizarre occult ritual, uh, and so did Drudge. This was on the television the week before the election. I know we live in different worlds often, but um, that was what was going on. They were throwing shit against the fans seeing what was, seeing what was taking. Or a wall? I don't know what that is. Next slide, please. Um, so 
part, then the, the worst part is this affects specific people. Now, some of you might know about Seth Rich, who's a DNC staffer, who um, was killed in a, what DC police believe was a, a botched robbery. It may not have been a botched robbery. It was in a bad neighborhood. It was 3.30 in the morning. Um, no one really knows what it was. Um, but it wasn't, uh, Hillary Clinton personally did not drive by and shoot her in the face, but a lot of people believe that. So, um, uh, the, Sean Hannity for weeks and weeks went on about this and he was citing one specific guy named Rod Wheeler who uh, had been pressured by a Fox News reporter to say that um, Seth Rich had uh, a bunch of WikiLeaks files on his hard drive before he was killed. It's not true. It didn't happen. Uh, it doesn't matter um, because he just kept going and it went on for weeks and then eventually it turned out that Rod Wheeler had been set up by that Fox News reporter but it affected that family who kept begging him to stop, and they wouldn't stop. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. Um, so eventually, what happened was uh, he moved on after, um, after it was found out that that uh, one guy was, was making, he wasn't making it up, but he'd been pressured into make, like conceiving of a larger Seth Rich conspiracy. And now he blames a guy named Imran Awan who is just a, a, a Muslim man who uh, was uh, not allowed to go back to his home in Pakistan because uh, he did poor paperwork for Demi Rosherman Schultz, but they believe that that's, it, now he believes that he did the DNC hack. And it doesn't matter what happened previously, this is just what they believe now. And also now it's, he was to sell face cream in specific Facebook ads. It's, it's not good. Next slide, please. Um, oh, here's the other way it, it uh, affects direct people. So Gateway Pundit keeps doing this thing where they keep framing people for mass murderers right, mass murders right after it happens. This happened at Charlottesville. Um, they framed a 20-year-old kid who they believed had like owned the car um, that rammed through people. He didn't. He just had a similar kind of car, but whatever. That was enough for him. Um, he, the guy, that kid was at a wedding, and uh, he's like an electronic music artist, I don't know, whatever. And um, Esteban Santiago, so they found this other guy named Esteban Santiago, and that was enough as well. Even though it's a really common name, they just decided that an Esteban Santiago uh, in uh, New Jersey was the dude, and they put his picture everywhere, and it wasn't him. Next slide, please. Um, so here's some stuff that was going on in Info Wars the past couple weeks. Um, I swear to God, this was here two weeks ago. Uh, is the, the final, final, final proof that Michelle Obama is a man that was leading their website. I don't know what to say about that. And uh, so, my favorite thing that happened in the past couple of weeks with Infowars is uh, that children have been kidnapped and sent to Mars as child sex slaves. Uh, it's impossible because you'd have to go to. By the time they get to Mars, they'd be 20. But let's not think about it. So what I did, uh, let's go to the next slide. I, um, I called NASA, and uh, they very angrily denied it to me, and they don't like me anymore. Not at all. Um, I'm not sure I can call NASA anymore, because too bad. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> all right, cool. So let's go to Russia now. This is a real meme that I found um, about Russia. Uh, people want you to believe that Russia has nothing to do with a bunch of this stuff, and that's fine. You can do whatever you want. I'm going to tell you uh, why they do and why it's beneficial for them to participate in this. They're not behind everything, but they're behind a, a fair amount of it, and they were especially before the election. Um, next slide. Um, so here's a glossary of assholes and dipshits. This is very important. Um, I'm not kidding. <laughs> so um, there are four kinds of people here. This is by Clint Watts. So Clint Watts is a former Joint uh, Terror Task Force dude in the FBI who uh, talks about Russian influence. Um, he's really big into this and has been tracking this for a long period of time. And um, he breaks people down into four categories. So state actors, that's obvious. It's Kremlin. It's Russia, things like that. Uh, it's people who have an interest in getting fake news out there to discredit um, like American hegemony. It's fine. Useful idiots. Now, this is where it gets sort of complicated. These are people, a lot of people believe Al Jones is a useful idiot, right? He has, uh, he, he loves Russian shit. He just loves the culture. He's just really into it. He loves 
defending the Kremlin. Is he working directly with the Kremlin? Probably not. But uh, if he isn't, what's his incentive? Who knows? But that, that's what makes him a useful idiot. That's what a useful idiot is. And that's a Russian term that we have adopted for uh, Russians specifically. Fellow travelers are people who believe in stuff that uh, the Russian government also believes, like traditionally xenophobic foreign policy, um, things like that. He's really into, um, like, so like Alex Jones is into that stuff too, but he has no political purpose behind it. He's just doing it to stir up stuff. This is like a very specific uh, kind of person who just believes in Russian um, talking points. It, agent provocateurs. Um, so this is more financial motivation. Alex Jones is definitely part of this too. You can be many of these things. Milo Yiannopoulos is exactly that. Uh, these are people who uh, profit off um, putting up inflammatory stuff. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. They're just really into it. And an important thing to remember here is just asking the question. So RT, which is the uh, Kremlin-run te television station for the West, their motto is question more, um, which is innocuous. But then you start, if we go to the next slide, you start seeing stuff like this. So um, there's, this is a Russian BuzzFeed knockoff called In the Now. And what they did was on Facebook, they had a woman, like a, like a sexy Russian woman, give this speech but, um, that had three million views last time I checked. Um, and it's about how that the Aleppo bombings didn't actually happen. They didn't happen. Like, all those dead people made up. It was never bombed. Because they have a geopolitical interest in making sure Assad could just continue to recklessly bomb the hell out of people. Um, at the end, you say, the question is, do you buy it? It's always that. It's always, I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm just saying, consider the fact that it couldn't have. It's always innuendo. And you might see a parallel between our president and that idea. It's not Hillary Clinton is a child rapist. It's, hmm, isn't Hillary kind of crooked? It's that sort of thing. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a really convoluted chart that Clint Watts sent me. It's incomprehensible. Um, but you can see here um, how like the shades of gray here. So the overt propaganda is on the left. It's RT, Sputnik, that sort of thing. In the nows over there, very specific things like that. In the middle, you got we don't know Infowars, we got uh, um, uh, WikiLeaks, things like that. We don't know why they're doing it, but we know they are harping on Russian talking points. The Aleppo is fake news thing was in, was in Infowars, was in Gateway Pundit, things like that. And then there's like, we don't, we really don't know. <laughs> this, this covert group of people, uh, like faceless trolls on Twitter, um, uh, large botnets that all spout the same talking point but aren't actually people. Honeypots are uh, people who, uh, like fishing situations or back in the day it used to be women who used to, um, for example, like go to a, like a, let's just say like a Moscow Ritz and get uh, two prostitutes to pee on a bed that Barack Obama slept on, just like hypothetically. Anyways, next slide. Um, oh, this is the last slide. So um, this is what Clint Watts said. It's not just an information war in America, it's a war on information itself. The point of it is that you can't trust anything, then there's no baseline. You can say and do whatever you want, then deny it ever happened. He said that about Aleppo. And, uh, and Ru Russia's sort of response to it. And this is a tactic. This is what it is. Like, this is the world we're living in now, where objective realities aren't objective anymore. And there's a reason for it. Um, it really helps a bunch of people, whether it's helping you sell boner pills, which is possible, or if it's helping you destabilize the West, it's also a thing. But um, it's happening. Um, uh, I would say be skeptical. Do not be cynical. Um, that's a big way to help, help your way sort through this stuff. But um, uh, I have a little bit of hope it's going to end soon because it's just, isn't it exhausting living in this? <laughs> it really is. Um, yeah, so that's, that, that's it for me. I think Brian's going to come up and we're going to, and Nick's going to come up and we're going to talk about stuff. Cool. Actually, I might move because we I've got a microphone to give to folks. Sure. Uh, I don't know, Nick. Do you want to? Is there anything you want to comment on having just heard that, or? I'll jump in. Yeah. Uh, answers to questions and. Okay. Yeah. And spontaneously. 
So I want to give a chance to let the audience ask questions. Uh, I can ask them questions, but I want to see if you guys have questions. Let me get this one here. And I'll, I'll wait for the microphone and I'll, so everybody can hear you. Thank you for coming. Sure thing. You just said you don't think it's going to last or it's going to end soon. How is that possible? <laughs> I'm uh, clinging uh, this, to that. This is going to go on forever. But I, I don't think people are going to uncritically read random rumors in the internet anymore. Um, for I mean, it, it's going to... We were talking about this earlier, but like, uh, I'm 30, and I'm 29, and um, it, it, uh, I, you meet a 30-year-old who trusts the bank, trusts a bank, and I will give you a million dollars. Like, there is nobody who trusts a bank. Because 10 years ago, we had a financial crisis that really... Uh, it made it so we were horrified of them, or like the Iraq War, or Freya War, and that's good. Um, people who, college students, these guys are, are like, know the tools, know that this is innuendo, know that it's made up, and um, they're, they are thankfully mobilizing, and everybody else is going to get exhausted by this and try to figure out why we have a president that says nothing happened that really happened. If we have four years of this, people are going to be tired. Um, it's pretty easy to spot. So I, I think that's that's my hope. Um, it's going to take a lot of empathy um, training for our for our kids and for people uh, who who are adults too. But it's part of the deal. And also, like Facebook and Twitter have to fix their algorithms to make it so this stuff doesn't show up as much. But there's a lot of space. There's a ton of room for improvement, and no one's taken any steps yet. So. <laughs> I think once you once you start it, we're in we're in good shape. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. It's been an interesting discussion, uh, kind of incommensurate. So Nick Scal gave us his work of investigative journalism um, with a, you know, a lot of research. Uh, ben, you've given us an interesting disquisition on with a lot of straw men. I lost you to about the 15 straw men. Okay. <laughs> okay. There are a lot of scarecrows out there like Alec Jones. And those are lead distractors and that's great. They make their money, they sell their pills. But you can have someone saying what Nick and others have done, devoted their lives to, taking extreme risks with their careers. And you could have someone say, you know, I read this about Gary Webb. This guy did a lot of work, and the CIA was in the mix, very much in the mix. Mm -hmm. And a guy like you on, on another day would say, ridiculous. I wouldn't. I really wouldn't. I, I, I think, I was talking to them earlier. There was a time last week where I was being threatened to be sued by two millionaires and a billionaire. That's true, because I, I dig in. I, there are stories that take months that I do. Um, there, uh, the story I did on Chris took you know took a month roughly because you have to. Do, do, I I really recommend you read some of my work because at the end of it, what I what I do with all this stuff is I go directly to the source. I've followed money, track where all is happening. Um, I I I it, it the idea that it's not dangerous is inconceivable, frankly. <laughs> But I, what, what I do is I, I, I find um, uh, I, I find it what's the, the motivation behind all these people, behind the people bankrolling in part the president, behind the people bankrolling you know conspiracy theorists all the time. Um, and I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. And you know I, I didn't go into like a drug den somewhere weird, right? But like uh, it, the the idea that like I haven't been doxxed for this or like that I'm sitting in a in a oh yeah go for it I, keep going. Can you identify the strong man, please? I don't want to take I don't want to monopolize here. Um, they, you give us these extreme examples of these cartoon characters. Okay, great. We can all we all recognize them, but. There's, well, it's the there's, president, so like I, I understand yeah, what you're saying. Right, it's the president, you know. No, I, I, why yeah. is he just not important? Yeah, no, he's very important. <laughs> but the the uh, the facts behind what Nick is talking about, 
get completely lost in that. Whatever you're writing, hey, you I'm true? sorry I haven't read it, but it's not lost sure. in these sort of series of caricatures. No, that's I, my I'm only not point. Sure. I, I don't want to take No, 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 that's okay. Time. No, no, no. I just want to, uh, I'm wondering if it's Nick, no, I get you. I'm just wondering if Nick thinks that's true. No, I mean, I think the work that you're doing, you're in the trenches on a war for truth, basically. And so I come at this, you know, with a lot of background in, in national security and in media criticism and everything. And I, I think, uh, you know, what's happening right now, there's uh, the profession of journalism, as I know all too well, print journalism specifically, is in an existential crisis. And, uh, you know, <laughs> pardon me? Well, like, wh why? Well, let's unpack okay, can, that. Can you give, give us some more information, please. Well, I'd like, to, uh, if, if possible, let me try to unpack that a little bit. <laughs> I'll just let it out. All right. Some, I mentioned James Risen. The guy wasn't on my top ten list of favorite reporters because he wrote some bullshit about Gary Webb back in the day, and I didn't really appreciate that. But I still know enough by reading what he's written that this is a very aggressive guy that's got some serious wavos, and he's written some really important work. And we know what we know because of guys like him that do what they do. And so I interviewed him and a bunch of other people that work for papers that would never hire me in a million years because of maybe some sort of, you know, um, you know, bone of contention over what I've written about Gary Webb, that kind of thing. So, like, from my perspective, I've taken risks. I've been blacklisted a little bit, and I don't regret it. But that doesn't mean that everybody that works for those papers is full of shit. There's some really great people, and we need institutions that do serious digging and actually, you know, um, fight these battles over over this BS that's being spread around on the internet and social media and just like confusing people and distracting people and it needs to be written about that's somebody's got to do it yeah I'm, I'm just curious like what's your what's your me I don't mean to what's your media diet like what's your what do you read well, into it what's my media diet yeah what do you what do you read on a daily basis uh, counterpunch salon um, uh, Jacobin um, uh, I read a lot of writers. Perry, you know, I read folks that have been doing this stuff for a long time. So you, you do understand that's a very specific filter bubble, there, right? That's a very far left filter bubble. I read, I read, man. We're saturated with right, so it's everywhere, right? But you cannot; these people cannot get in the mainstream. These people are blackballed from the mainstream. So I'm going to them deliberately. I'm not going for an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. So what you know, the the, the conspiracy theories. The government had a conspiracy theory that was extraordinarily plausible about 19 hijackers. Extraordinarily plausible. Okay. All right. Now, 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 <laughs> that's right. It was extraordinarily implausible. I'll say it again. And full disclosure, so my name is Matthew Witt. I serve on the Consensus 9-11 panel. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a panel of world-class scientists, myself not included. I'm a local social scientist. I work at the University of Laverne. We've got people not doing conspiracy theorizing. Man. They're looking at the science of claims. That's what you do in a democracy. You mm -hmm. look at facts. You look at facts and you measure them. Without that, we're just storytelling. We can talk about other people's storytelling, but what troubles me is when you insinuate that none of this is ever true. That, that's such a I'm not sure I said that. I really don't think I said that, man. It's such a broad brush. OK. Let me. Okay. Okay, and I, maybe you've written about it. I, I don't think 9-11 was an inside <laughs> yeah, job. Yeah, I don't think so. Either. Sorry. <laughs> well, I said what do you say? Okay, well, I think we're going to, thank you. I think we're going to move on just to get some other folks in. Uh, you had a question? When you were talking, I felt so good. Integrity, moral, uh, substance. Uh, it, it, Re reinforced my um, view of journalism. When he started talking, I don't want to listen to any journalist because I don't think there's any moral integrity for something to go through this many people and come out on Facebook. Where are the journalists along the way? Where are your types? Well, I mean, we, <laughs> you know, a lot of the mechanics of what you see on social media and the slideshow that you just saw 
you know, is driven by the knowledge and Breitbart and Steve Bannon, these guys are geniuses at this They're stuff of what's going to get hits and get an visceral or a visceral immediate emotional reaction out of people. And so for us, like at the paper where I work at, we, we get our hits by publishing slideshows of college students running around in their underwear. Uh, you know, <laughs> once a year, that's a big thing that they do at Chapman or, or a big punk rock show, you know, or whatever stuff that, that we kind of throw out there is like red meat and that we can take our corporate overlords and say, look, we got two million hits this month, but that allows us to do our work. And it doesn't get as much hits, but it's really important stuff. And so basically, journalists have to always try to focus on the bigger story, try to get the truth out, but they're often, and this is what I was referring to when I say an existential crisis, it's expensive to do investigative reporting. You can't do it overnight. You can't just do it, you know, five times a day, uh, you know, on a blog. It takes a lot of time and a lot of money, and it's just the economic model for it is vanishing. And, and journalists are now being uh, portrayed and positioned by the president as, yeah. like, the enemy of the people. I mean, literally... And as a reporter working in conservative Orange County since the late 90s, I would wear an OC Weekly t-shirt and people would come up to me and say, are you a communist? You know, <laughs> and so this is what we're doing. This, it's crazy. It's kind of like, and now Orange County is normal. Yeah. And the rest of the country is kind of crazy. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I, so the other thing is that's, that, that's a small sort of, not, not small clearly, but that's a, that's a, as he said, that's a well-funded part of uh, uh, the right where, you know, Steve Bannon is bankrolled by this guy named Robert Mercer, who's a, um, who's a, who's a billionaire who just recently got involved in politics. He owns this website called, he was, sorry, he owns this company called Cambridge Analytica. That's a very specific filter bubble that has gotten considerably larger because of Facebook and Twitter and things like that. But, um, the, the journalists are the ones that you don't know their names because they're working really hard. Um, it, you know, uh, no offense to Nick, I just don't think you're on the cover of Us Weekly every week. But like, no. it's yeah, it's too bad. You should be. There's, Very there's handsome still guy. time. There's yeah, still exactly. Time. But like, the, the New, York, New York Times reporters are incredible, and if you, it's very hard to name them because um, they're they're working hard all day. They're not going on TV. They're not going on hardball every night and debating people. So uh, there's tons of good journalists. J journalists who care are everywhere, and they're deeply into it, and they go home every night just like I do, and don't sleep because we want to get the facts right. We really do. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, the louder things are in that chart up there um, sometimes. Uh, and uh, good journalism will win because over time people will just see the sham and the other stuff. Look at one here. Um, so as a millennial, I've been kind of raised on the internet and on the age of free stuff I guess so I not I'm never paid for a newspaper in my life I'm not used to I'm used to all my things getting um, subsidized by ads so how do you think that and then so you see things like Alex Jones um, kind of having an agenda in order to sell things to you know uh, fun to show well how do you see that in the rise of the internet and the rise of the free economy kind of changing journalism uh, today and in the future sure I've been I've been for a long time um, harping on the idea that we need a different metric than so the, the web server runs in this thing called unique visitors which is um, just raw eyeballs it's just the amount of people that come to your website and then advertisers um, use that metric to, for uh, for their advertising rates so Facebook has very high uh, a, a very a, like the largest amount of unique visitors maybe in the his history of people <laughs> Um, so they get they have high advertising rates. They have the ability to reach a lot of different people. Um, that needs to change because uh, a unique visitor does not mean a, a good reader, <laughs> a loyal reader, or somebody who's like uh, good, like that advertisers want to be associated with necessarily. Um, Fifty million random people is probably worse than twenty million people that um, will buy your stuff. So that needs to change. Um, that's a big that's a big part of it. Um, but there is I think I, I'm more optimistic about. Um, good journalism being subsidized as well recently especially um, especially since the election where people now realize that um, well like like well sourced verified information is is a commodity that we need like it's a it's a very necessary thing Nick yeah I mean I I just feel lucky that I've been able to work 20 years for the same newspaper I'm still there because of the core 
crew of uh, investigative reporters that we have there. We've taken down uh, a couple of mayors, sheriff uh, of Orange County, put in prison. We've gotten innocent people out of jail. I mean, it, the work is its own reward. That said, I mean, there are very few people outside of the very small circle of folks that I work with still that are in journalism that I've worked with over the years. I mean, by and large, it is a very difficult um, profession to remain employed in. And it's just, there's so much happening and things are changing so quickly right now. And there's so much instability. Uh, it's a very, you know, difficult time. So I'm, I'm optimistic on a certain level, but, you know, it just, uh, it, it's hard. It's hard to, uh, to see people craving information and instinctively knowing how important it is to the health of our society and our democracy, but being unwilling to pay anything for it. And until that gets figured out, until we can figure out how to actually, you know, monetize and reward, you know, um, ongoing, consistently, you know, relevant journalism, uh, you know, we're allowing it to just fall apart and as a, as a uh, profession. Which is kind of a glum statement. Another question? Sorry. Hey guys, thanks for coming. So, in sort, sort of the way that people worry about um, the uh, Cambridge Analytica targeting for ad, specific targeting of yeah, ads, yep. based on your personality profile, which is, I heard that they had something like 4,000 pieces of data in unique pieces of data on each voter in America that during the last right, election. Yeah. And, um, the um, for ads, you know, I guess we, we can say, oh well, maybe there maybe there's some benefit in ads being more relevant to me. But I wonder the way that people worry about AI taking over things. Yeah. I worry about things like Cambridge Analytica creating news feeds essentially that are tailored that they know will get people to click, which you're, you guys are saying is the bread and butter of your industry. And so if, the, if this um, analytics package that I can purchase will make people click on the news uh, that I feed them and I feed them it because it will click and make them click, yeah. um, how do we stop that? Is yeah. there a stopping that? Yeah, because that from, seems in the way it, that AI is going to take over, that seems like that's going to take over. Dude, you, don't you, click. Yeah, don't click. You, know, you nailed it. And I don't think we can rely on people to not click, right? So so it's it comes down to me. It's like I, it comes down to um, Facebook prioritizing things that aren't that right. And you can't tell people like you can't serve somebody something and say this is fake news. Don't click on it because they know it exists. Then um, it, you you have to like for example here's here's one way that that's fixable. Twitter has this thing where you can create an account um, on mass because they're open API. Uh, which means you can just sort of manipulate the code to create a bunch of accounts en masse. You can attach a profile picture to it. You can create a fake name around it. And people do that to create large botnets, right? Uh, large uh, bot networks that exclusively exist to retweet one specific account or amplify one specific account. So once they do that, right, um, they can they can have a one specific, like our, we, we hired a, a reporter a couple weeks ago named Joseph Cox, who, uh, uh, whose account was targeted, and what they'll do is they'll make their they'll make uh, their target's account inoperable because they give one of their tweets like a hundred thousand retweets just to first of all put the fear of God in them, and second of all make it harder for him to do his job. Right? Twitter can stop this now, tomorrow. They can require you to confirm your email address before you sign up for an account. That's what they can do. But they would lose an enormous amount of new Twitter users and daily active users that aren't even users. They're robots. So that's a way to stop this, but uh, it, 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 they're a public company. They're beholden to their shareholders. So if it shows up next, you know, in uh, the Q2 report, or Q3 report, that they've, their growth was like way behind schedule, then um, it'll be a disaster for them. So they, they have a responsibility, but they have uh, an obligation to their shareholders. <laughs> so um, we need more media literacy first before we get to that point, but that's really the way to stop it. But you're right, Cambridge Analytica is a nefarious actor in this specific place. Yeah. Nick, you want, anything you want to? I mean, I'm not sure what else I can add to that. Um, yeah, no. But. OK, uh, one last question. Let me get the student in the back here. Yeah.
Uh, you you mentioned uh, crisis actors, and I wasn't yeah. I wasn't really sure if I felt uh, that what you were saying about them was necessarily accurate. Can you kind of just give me like a repeat Ooh. of what your definition of crisis actors was? Sure. Uh, so in in Chris's case, it's it, it can be a bunch of different things. In Chris's case, he was told that he was uh, cr like his uh, story was sort of invented by the government. Um, that he was somehow taken as a CIA agent, it was always a CIA agent, right? Um, and that uh, he and his girlfriend uh, were put in this plot, and she was either swept away to some like to somewhere else, put into hiding, or in that day she was wearing makeup or something. There are various different ways you can be a crisis actor, but that's and there are various different um, thing theories in the internet about him. So um, yeah, sorry. What, what do you th what do you think of this? Um, the the ones that I'm more, uh, I would say, prone to, the ones I know more about, are yeah. the, the ones who say, or there's, for instance, there'd be an example of one person who uh, strategically, and uh, they say co uh, coincidentally, was just in, uh, let's say, the, the Boston Marathon bombing. And then two years later, they were at another bombing or another thing. For instance, um, the one in, uh, the one that was taken in Florida, the shooting. Um, and there are people who were there uh, and then they were also at another uh, thing. As in, it's it's the whole idea that you know they were already it was already or they were involved with it, and it was already brought up. It was known about already. So they have people planted there to bring fear in the media. And so it's so. For instance, let's say I was a crisis actor. I was. Let's say. But yeah, let's say. Um, and let's say something's going to happen, there's going to be a bombing soon, and then for some reason I'm there, I just happen to be the one there on TV, and then three years later, I'm in the, I'm in the exact same situation, but in a different location. Okay, that, that's the kind of crisis actor that I've always been prone well, to know. Can I just jump in on that? I mean, if, if you were trying to, you know, stun and traumatize the public into submission through these terrible traumatic events, wouldn't you look for different people to be in the background shots each time? I mean, why would no, you the, the, hire, like, the same people each yeah. time? Oh, let's call like Jeff up and see what's up. It's like, it gives the whole <laughs> thing away. It doesn't even make sense as a conspiracy theory. And I, I have to say, I mean, I've investigated a lot of this stuff, some of it related to 9-11. I wrote a story about this crew that their theory was that so a lot of the people that doubt that the Pentagon was hit by this airplane think that the U.S. government shot a missile into it, right? But these guys don't agree with that. They have their own theory, which is that the plane that everyone saw that they thought crashed into the building was actually flown right over the Pentagon right before this explosion took place to trick people into thinking that the plane was involved. But there were uh, detonations that took place that, that caused the damage to the building, and it was all covered up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then the question becomes, anybody that was a witness to what happened that says, well, no, I actually saw the plane at such and such a time, or it was over here, in, in any way, shape, or form, doesn't fit into the narrative that they have that they're trying to prove, which they claim they have scientific evidence to back up and everything, all those people automatically become government plants. So, I mean, the fact that there were a lot of uh, uh, DC reporters that were witnesses to the Pentagon explosion isn't really all that odd when you think about how many reporters there are that work in that area. There's a lot of them. They were on their way to work when it happened that morning. They were right across the street. But, you know, that in and of itself became evidence, oh, well, it's a conspiracy by these reporters to try to cover up the truth and we can't believe what they say. And then you get into like, well, what happened with the bodies of the people that were on the airplane that didn't crash into the Pentagon but just flew over? Well, then it, either they were taken out to a military base and shot and buried or something, or, or the plane was remote controlled and no one was in it. I mean, it gets wilder and wilder and wilder. But all that government plants and crisis actors, it's sort of a narrative that people have because they're looking for like comfortable explanations to things that they're afraid about, whether it's having their guns taken away and not thinking that these massacres could possibly be real, you know. It just it's out of control. Can, can I add to that? Yeah. Okay. For two things. One, um, I don't I don't really agree with you when, it's, when you came when it comes to debunking the idea of there's like let's say like what you said you know how is how is that how are they going to bring fear to if there's going to be a person at multiple places the, th the problem with that is not not no one notices that I just happen to be one of the people who notices that because I do so much research I would say almost too much research for that kind of things I've oh, noticed where there's one person who's in in like two or three different spots at the same time and I know how you said that you know that's ridiculous and it sounds ridiculous but. Not many a simple people know this explanation that you're confused and that those are not the same people. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, I guess. I so, know. like, do you, do you um, 
do you know about the the theories about my about my about Chris? Chris? About Chris? No, I never All heard right, this cool. one. Well, I will say that it's a particularly cruel thing to do um, to to ha- find people that have lived through a terrible thing and say to them, "You're not only that your experience is invalid, that these things didn't happen." But that the world you know is not correct. Um, these, like, they're, they're and I, I understand what you're saying. Like, again, I, I, I think I don't know if I talked about this. I'm, I'm susceptible to this. I, I grew up very far away from a city. <sighs> Jesus Christ. I grew up, I grew up far away from the city, and I grew up with the internet, right? And um, <laughs> oh, good lord. Um, and it was ex. ex- Extremely easy for me to spend lots, lots of times on the lots of time on the internet, assuming that everything I thought was exactly correct. And then I met people. That was it. I grew up so I, I when I was with Chris in college, we had a shitty sports radio show, and then I was in his fantasy league for for a couple of years. And then this happened, and um, it was hellish for him. And then it was even more hellish. And I just want you to put to put the humanity of people that you know in into perspective here. Um, I, I, I just hope that you do that. You don't have to, but um, a lot of this like random trolling shit that makes people's lives really hard, and it makes it hard for journalists too. I know you love investigative journalism, but we spend all day um, being attacked by people who think they know everything, and all we do is try to get the story as best as we can and we try to tell it with empathy and care and uh, then we have people in the middle row who believe that 9-11 is not such a job <laughs> so yeah I don't know is that am I way off yeah I mean I just wanted to end by mentioning that I'm surprised that this hasn't already happened yet but every time I bring up Gary Webb in a public setting I inevitably get the question well why do you think he committed suicide if he shot himself in the head twice I investigated this in detail I talked to everybody that knew him his family and became friends with them I was already friends with Gary and excuse me uh, anyways thought yeah. someone had a, a, a question but anyways um, I mean, this guy, his career was completely ruined as a result of trying to tell the truth. And he was let down by his own profession and attacked unfairly and savagely by the most powerful media institutions on the planet. And it ruined his life. Uh, he went through a divorce. He was about to move in with his mother. And he planned his suicide out months in advance and reserved the cremation service, sent numerous letters to different people. He was on the phone with a, an ex-girlfriend moments before he killed himself and told her he was going to do it. She knew all about it and you know, tried to stop him and talk him out of it, didn't think he was serious. The guy was clinically depressed. Why wouldn't he be? His career was ruined. I've gone through this myself. How do you think I felt when I read in the, New- in the LA Times that a discredited reporter you know, had committed suicide? A, I instinctively knew that it was probably true because I had been in touch with him. I knew what he was going through. B, it just outraged me that they just you know, were insulting him even in death egregiously. And the idea that the CIA would wait 10 years after his life had been ruined on the day he was planning his own suicide and come in and shoot him an extra time is ridiculous. There's a very natural explanation for what happened involving a hair trigger on his father's gun that he was gripping for hours contemplating taking his own life. And the first bullet grazed his cheek. The second bullet nicked an artery. If anybody had heard the gunshot, he would have survived. He bled to death over a period of like 10 hours. Um, And there was a sign on the door telling his family not to come inside and uh, or the movie actually because they were supposed to pick up his boxes which weren't even packed and so anyways I mean it, it, w- it would make me personally so much more happy to think that he had been assassinated yeah and it would give a different meaning to the sacrifice that he made professionally and personally but it would let the media off the hook and it, it just it just infuriates me that people just you know I understand why it sounds suspicious multiple gunshot wounds but you got to think you know what are the facts? You've got to read carefully. You've got to know what you're talking about. And it's not okay or cool to just be cynical and think, well, yeah, you know, I bet that's not true because who trusts the media? I mean, it's, that's a cop-out. I mean, you're doing yourself a disservice and the country is falling apart as a result, I think, of the lack of effort by people to actually rationally try to interpret the news. Yeah. So. 
Agreed. Well, I think on that point, wow. that was fun.